you would take your Bible with me this morning and turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Preaching the gospel is not an easy task. You know, every, every time I look at any particular passage of scripture, I'm always looking for the gospel. And I know every time that I stand up here, I always want to preach the gospel. I don't want to go away from this place having of merely given you some sort of theoretical lesson or presented to you some eloquent soliloquy, which I don't think I'm capable of doing that anyhow. <clears throat> I know this. Paul said, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ. That's his person. And him crucified. And so any time we look in this book, whether it's Old Testament or New, whether it's the Apostle Paul or it's King Solomon that we're going to look at this morning, we need to always look at it in light of this particular thing. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable, first of all, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. For instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be thoroughly or thoroughly furnished under every good word. So before I can ever do anything, or you can ever do anything by way of obedience that is pleasing and acceptable to God, you yourself, a sinner by birth, by nature, by practice, and even by choice, even still, you must, you must... Be made in Christ the very righteousness of God. I am a sinner, sure enough. But I tell you what, in Christ my Lord, I am holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Do you believe that? I see, because apart from that, you got no gospel. Because the gospel is what? A declaration of good news. It's not a declaration of rules and regulations and stipulations. It's a declaration. Christ came as sent, promised, prophesied, purposed by God. Christ actually in time accomplished everything necessary to redeem all those given to him by God the Father in the everlasting covenant of grace. Every single solitary one of them, Kenny. And in turn, when Christ was raised from the dead, significantly proving to you and me the efficacy of his work, that it had actually accomplished redemption, Christ Jesus sends forth his Holy Spirit in each successive generation to reveal Christ in you, the hope of glory, to each and every one of the objects of his love. That's the gospel. And that's what we declare unto you every single solitary time. People say, you got nothing else to say but that? Got nothing else to say but that. I've entitled this message this morning, one word, remember. You know, memory is an amazing thing, is it not? We remember the good, we remember the bad. We look back as we come to the conclusion of 2019 and we look forward with great expectancy like most people in this world to 2020 and the future that is ahead of us. And I'll guarantee you over this next, really throughout this entire month and particularly in this last couple of days of the year, almost everybody I know without exception are going to make New Year's resolutions. Maybe you've made one. I'm going to lose weight, or I'm going to quit smoking, or I'm going to quit drinking, or I'm going to start going to church more. Right? You know, all these things that men come up with. And the new year will come, and the new year will start, and you will start out with your resolutions. And in a, with, I, can, I can assure you, because I'm one of you, and I've made New Year's resolutions in the past, probably three, four, five weeks down the line, you know what's going to happen to all your resolutions? They're going to become fading memories. All of them. And the reason is, is because we put too much emphasis on the now, on the things of time, on the things of this earth. We shouldn't. 
I tell you, the older I get, the more I'm aware of that. You that are young, you don't think about things in that light. But I tell you, dump, dump over in your 60s and everything changes. Really started changing in my 50s. But when you roll over 60 and you see people that you knew and loved that are just a few years older than you leaving the part in this planet, it makes you think about these things. And see, here's the thing. If you know anything of the book of Ecclesiastes, and I would encourage you to go read it. It is a wonderful book. I'd like to take it and study through it verse by verse. But if you know anything of the book of Ecclesiastes, you know that Solomon continually declared by God-given wisdom the vanity. Now listen to this. He declares the vanity of everything. You hear me? Everything this world affords. I typed in the word vanity of vanity in my search engine on my uh, Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. I typed in the, just the word vanity and some 29 times in his 12-chapter epistle, 29 times the, the, the Solomon declares all is vanity or he declares this is also vanity. Go read the list of what he puts in that group. That word translated vanity, you know what it means? You never get this from the word vanity. It means vapor or breath. Vapor or breath. You say, well, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. Why? Vapor of breath? Well, I tell you what, we don't have many cold days in Louisiana, but when we do, when you walk outside, what comes out of your mouth? When you breathe out of your mouth? It's a vapor. How long does it stay there? It's just momentary. And that's what he's saying of everything in this world. Everything in this world, what is it? It's a vapor. It's a mist. It's a, it's a mystery. And it's gone in a moment. And see, here's the thing. This conclusion of the futility and actual worthlessness of everything in this life, it wasn't drawn by a pauper. It wasn't drawn by a man that was down on his luck. Who's drawing these conclusions? King Solomon. The wisest man outside of our Lord Jesus Christ who ever existed. And the thing you need to know about King Solomon, that's why I read 1 Kings chapter 3. God said his wealth and his prominence and his power and his, the knowledge of him would exceed who? Everybody. You ever heard of the Queen of Sheba? See, you, you learn some things when you get to looking at books. Like Queen of Sheba, wasn't, she wasn't poor by any stretch of the imagination. She had everything that she wanted. But listen to the way she describes this man, Solomon. And when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, and this is what she heard of him. What's, it, what's Solomon's fame and renown? Did he can split a baby? No. What's his fame? Concerning the name of the Lord. What's he know? If Solomon don't know anything else, I know he knows one thing. What does he know? The name of the Lord. I know this much. Romans chapter 10 tells me, whosoever shall call on what? The name of the Lord shall be saved. So he, Solomon knew the Lord. That's what she's amazed with. This guy knows God, knows Jehovah, knows, knows the true one, Jehovah. That's what that word Lord, capital L-O-R-D, means. It's Jehovah, the self-existent one. She came to prove him with hard questions. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. I don't know this guy, but she tells him everything. And Solomon told all her all her questions. There was not anything hid from the king, which he told her not. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom, and the house that he had built, and the meat of his table, and the sitting of his servants, and the attending of his ministers, and their apparel, and his cupbearers, and his accents by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. Knocked her out. And she said to the king, It is a true report 
that I heard in my own land of thy acts and of thy wisdom. How be it? I believe not the words. Until I came and mine eyes had seen it. And this is the conclusion she drew. And behold, the half of it was not told me. You think he's got some things? Thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard. And old Solomon said to her and said, Look at me. No, no. You think about this. This same Solomon who has this great queen of Sheba tell him all these great things about him. He declares all of it. What did he declare it all? Vanity of vanities. Every bit of it. What is it? It's vanity. Why did Solomon view these things this way? Huh? There's only one answer. There's only one reason why Solomon would look at everything this world affords and counts it as vanity and foolishness, a mere vapor that's there for a moment and gone. Here's why he had seen, he had known, and he had possessed. What did he possess? The righteousness of God. The same righteousness his father had. And in comparison to this glorious, eternal dress, the righteousness of the Lord, the Messiah, the promised one, everything else temporal, what does it do? It fades into the background. I love it. Listen to Paul writing to the Corinthian believers. He said, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen. What do we don't look at? We don't look at the things that are seen. But we look at the things which are not seen. It's amazing. That's, that's kind of a paradox, isn't it? Looking at things that are not seen. Kind of like Moses believed in him who is invisible. See, seeing him who's invisible. How can you see what's invisible? For the things which are seen, what are they? They're temporal. But the things which are not seen, those things, what are they? They are eternal. Now, I want to be very clear here at the beginning of this message. In this matter of eternal salvation, and I, I don't ever back up from this, Kenny. I just can't. I'm grateful for it, and I'm thankful that the Word of God confirms everything that I... I'm about to say to you this morning. In this matter of eternal salvation, we know that God is absolutely sovereign in all things, particularly in salvation. And that a sinner's salvation, and listen to this, a sinner's salvation does not rest on an act of their own free will, nor can it be changed by any decision he or she or they might make. Listen to this. This is the word of God. This isn't me coming up with this stuff on my own. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil. You hear that? What have they not done? They ain't done anything. This ain't God looking down through some big spyglass out there in the future and seeing somebody do something, somebody not do something, and then making a decision before they had not done anything. What are we talking about? We're talking about the eternal counsel of our God. We're talking about when God chose his people in Christ Jesus, neither having done any good or evil, that the, listen, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. What's that? That's God calling out. The ecclesia. Not of works, but of him that calleth it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger, as it's written. Oh, Jacob have I loved. But Esau. Oh, Esau, Esau have I hated. Before they've done any good or evil. And the natural mind says what? Maybe you're sitting there this morning, that's just not fair. That's just nature. That's human nature. 
But it forgets the most important thing of all. Who are we dealing with? Huh? Our God, where's he at? He's in the heavens. And whatsoever he pleased, that did he in the heavens and in the earth and in all the deep places. Who are you to reply against God? Huh? Who, who among us would stand up and point our finger at the true and living God who holds eternity and destiny in his hand and say, you cannot do this that way? But they do. Do they not? Because Paul draws this conclusion. He says, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. What should we say then? If that's the truth, it's not based on men. What should we say then? Is, is God unrighteous? Heavens no. God forbid it. For he saith to Moses, here's the thing, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it's not of him that willeth, there's your free will, nor of him that runneth, there's your morality. But it's of God that does one thing only to sinners. Who does he justify, folks? Abraham believed on him who justifies the ungodly. In this short book, Solomon set forth the same exact conclusion. I know that whatsoever the Lord doeth, whatever God doeth, it's forever. Nothing can be added to it, and nothing can be taken from it, and God does it that way that men should fear should have reverence and respect for this God with whom we all have to do. But here's the thing. You say, well, if you believe what you believe that God's sovereign, and men, just, we, just, we just wait and see who God's elect are. I, I have not said that. You ever heard me say that? Sally? Mark? Been with me 32 years. You ever heard me say, well, we just wait and let it, let it all sort itself out. Even though I know a sinner can't change anything concerning their eternal salvation by act of their free will. Folks, you know what our responsibility is? We can and we must call on sinners to do one thing. Believe and rest in Christ as the Lord their righteousness. That's what we're doing this morning. And I hope you realize this morning, I've said this so many times over the last 32 years... You know, nowhere in the Word of God does God ever tell any sinner at any point in time to try to figure out whether they are elect of God or not. You find me that verse in the Bible. All I know is this. God calls on every sinner everywhere to do what? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we merely trust Him in it. We know, I, I know and I'm convinced more and more with every passing day that those who truly call on the name of the Lord, anyone that's ever called, they've never been turned away. Not one. But I also know this by, by nature. I know this according to the Scriptures too. The only reason you're going to call on Him, He's going to draw you. Same man that wrote this, wrote this. Song of Solomon. Draw me, and we'll run after you. The flip side of that is, you don't draw me, what will I never do? Let the Scripture speak to your heart this morning. No man can come to me except it were given to him of my Father. And that's what this preacher is doing. He, in this wonderful chapter we're going to look at this morning, he's setting forth this. He's calling on sinners to do what I'm calling on you to do this morning. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Rest in Him as your righteousness. Now, I don't have the time to go back and study the whole book, but I can tell you this much. In the, in the concluding chapter, in chapter 11, he had concluded that youthfulness itself, and I'm no longer a youth, Okay, he concludes that youthfulness itself, you know what youthfulness is? It's vanity, foolishness. And you, read, you know when we know, tell you why youthfulness is so vain? Because all old lustful passions and things that are so prominent when? When you're young. Listen to what he said, rejoice, O young man, in thy youth. 
And let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that all for all these things God will bring thee unto judgment. Therefore remove sorrow from thy heart, and put away evil from your flesh. For here it is, for childhood and youth. They're vanity. They're foolishness. And then he proceeds to the conclusion of the matter. He brings it over from being young you know what he talks about in this 12th chapter? We old now. And he starts it off this way. Remember now thy creator. I tell you, this is read at a lot of gravesides. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. This word translated remember, it means to call to mind or to think upon. And so Solomon here, he calls on us to do this. Remember now thy creator. Three English words, now thy creator, are but one Hebrew word. And that one word in the Hebrew in the original means to shape, to fashion, or to create. Here's, here's an important question you need to ask yourself this morning. Who's the only one who can create? Who can do it? Can you make yourself? Did you have anything to do with the creation of yourself? Can you make yourself anew? I know religion seems to think you can. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. And they think by that, they think that, that God's telling us that you've got to become something now that you weren't before. Is that what he's talking about? He doesn't say if any man is becoming a new crea creature. He says what? If any man be in Christ. Where's he at? In Christ. What is he or she? You in Christ this morning? You are a new creature. Old things are passed away. What? Guilt, penalty, condemnation of sin? Gone. All things have become new. What? Righteousness, acceptance, mercy, grace. Here's the same word. And it, it applies this. If remember now thy creator. It applies to but one person. Who's it talking about? It's talking about the true and living God. Here's the beginning. Here's the same word. God, that's Elohim, that's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. How do you know that? Because of what's said next. Let us. <laughs> yeah. Not let me. Let us. Make man in our own image, after our own likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. So God, Elohim, what did he do? Here's the same word, created. He fashioned. He formed. He shaped. What did he do? He fashioned, formed, and shaped man. God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. I tell you, Adam was in the image of our God. You and I are not. Adam fell. And when Adam fell, what did he lose? He lost that original uprightness before God. And we are sons and daughters of who? Adam. All of us. But here's the thing that I find so important about this. Solomon calls on all mankind to think or to call to mind Elohim, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the God of creation, and he tells them to do so when? In the days of their youth. While they're young men and women. See, think about it. This God, this creator should be remembered by who? It ought to be remembered by who? all men, but Specifically and especially by who? Young men. Young women. They should remember there is a God. Even though by nature, what are they not concerned about? They should remember that God is a God of great and glorious perfection. You should remember, remember now the, the, thy creator in the days... This God with whom we all have to do, he's omniscient. He sees everything. He sees what you and me are thinking right now, doesn't he? I don't believe that when you don't believe the book. He knows all things. He's omnipresent. Where, he's everywhere. He's omnipotent. What does that mean? Nobody can tell him what to do or tell him how to do it. 
But this same God who is omniscient and omnipresent and omnipotent and holy and just and true, folks, he judges this earth and he's going to judge this world in righteousness by that man. What's he going to judge this world in? By, in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Who's that man? The Lord our righteousness. You want, to be, you want to be holy this morning? You want to be in heaven this morning? You've got to be as righteous as God. I'm telling you this morning, this, this, is, this is the book. If you are not as holy as God Almighty, you're going to hell. Now you get there on your own. Tell me one act in your life that is as holy as God. Just one. Even if, even if you claim, well, I, I did, did all that bad stuff when I was a sinner, but when God saved me, I started doing something. Kind of like that lady on Facebook that told us, 1996, I've never committed another sin. Liar! That's not true. In all things we offend. Have you not sinned this morning? I mean, don't answer. Seriously. Think about everything in the light of what God's Word tells us. What does He command? Love God with some of your heart, some of your soul, some of your strength, some of your mind. Nuh uh. This God demands perfect allegiance. You're loving with what? All your heart. How often is that? 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, 66 sometimes. <laughs> 61, nearly 62 years. But even that ain't enough. For me to love God, where's it got to go to? Our eternity past, eternity future. Can you get there? That's what's required. That's just God we're dealing with. And then what do you got to do? Love your neighbor, which includes your enemy, I might add. How you love him? Like you said, which one of you this morning, and again, don't answer, which one of any of us here, myself included, have loved your enemy like you've loved yourself this morning? And keep in mind, you break the law in one point. You are a transgressor, and there is no way back. So what am I dealing with this morning? I am a guilty by nature sinner talking with who? <laughs> What are you? Oh, I'm, I'm better. No. <laughs> There's none good, no, not one. Not me, not you, not anybody, folks. And we should remember, too, this morning, I encourage you, remember that this God is in Christ. What is he? He is a gracious, merciful God, pardon iniquity, transgression, and sins. Remember that creator. All things are of God who hath, listen, who hath reconciled us to himself. How did he reconcile us to himself? By us fulfilling the condition of faith. No, 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 no. Who hath reconciled us unto himself. How did he do it? By Jesus Christ. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That's what I'm doing this morning. I'm telling you, what's the ministry of reconciliation? What am I to tell sinners? To wit, that is to say that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not charging their trespasses unto them. They should remember him under this character as a creator who made them. The same creator in whom we all live, move, and have our very being. All of us. Henry used to say to me and to just about all of us that grew up under his ministry, you only have one soul, don't you? And then he followed it always with this little caveat. Life's too short. Death's too sure. Judgment's too certain. And eternity is too long to play games with it. You only got one. Just one. I can't deal with it for my kids or for my wife or for my family. It's one-on-one, -on -one, me and the Lord God. That's it. And see, here's the thing. As believing parents and grandparents, 
we should use every means God has given us at our disposal to stress to our children and our grandchildren and our family and our friends the eternal value of Christ and his righteousness alone as the one thing needful, the one thing necessary. Since we know Christ and his righteousness is infinitely more valuable than anything this world can afford. Is it valuable to you this morning? In the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, you know Abraham called on the rich man to remember and hell. Remember that? That's a lot of remembers, isn't it? Likewise, Abraham said, Son, remember thou that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now what? He's comforted. And you're in torment. Remember our Lord's word. Jesus said to his disciples, If any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what's a man profited if he gains the whole world? It's vanity. You gain it all. You put all the money in the bank you want. I tell you what, your kids are spending. Now they will. Gain everything and lose your soul. What have you profited? What's more important? For your children, you got children this morning. What's the most important thing? That they're popular? That everybody likes them? That they're famous? That they're great sports people? That they're this or they're that? They're, they're, they're president? You know, I want my kid to be president of the United States. Well, big deal. If that's all he's got, he has not the righteousness of Christ. He's got nothing. But notice how the Holy Spirit, by the hand of his servant Solomon, drives home the importance of this. Notice, it, notice his language here. Look at the first part of verse, uh, look, at, look at verse 1. We're just going to read this. I'm not even going to comment on it because it, 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 it tells us what it is. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth while the evil days come not. See, when you're young, evil days ain't coming. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain, and the days when the keeper of the house shall tremble. What's that? That's, that's the legs. That's what he's taught. This is figurative language. Legs won't be, when you get old. I, I told Pam the other day, when we bought that house over on Wedgwood Drive where we stay at, <laughs> in 1998 I was a 41-year-old man. 40-year-old man. 39-year-old man. I used to would come out of my bedroom pitch black at night because all the living quarters is upstairs and I would rip out down that hallway, be putting a T-shirt on over my head going down two flights of stairs, Kenny. No concern about falling. If I'd have fell, I, I, fell, I, I fell one time when y'all was there. Remember the time I flop, flopped off the stairs and landed out there in the, in the front of the house? <laughs> I hit and it hurt and got up and dusted myself off other than embarrassment and the pain to my pride, I, I went on. We got all that stuff decorated up and all that stuff wrapped around the banister. Now when I come out of my bedroom at 61 years old, I turn every light in the house on. I make sure I have my T-shirt and stuff on before I take the first step. I make sure my house shoes are on my feet or I'm bare feet, footed, feeted, whatever. And I, I'm holding on to that rail as I come down. Because I know if I fall, Bart, there's consequences. As Pam told me, if I ever end up in the nursing home, I'm in a bind. <laughs> she said she ain't taking care of me at that house. By now I, end up, now I don't want to end up there. Yeah, I don't. Well, what is that? It's, it's old age. Used to, I'd climb up a ladder never think about it. Putting up Christmas decorations this year scared me to death on that 10-foot ladder. Why? I'm old. And things break on old people. They don't heal like they do when they're young people. The days when the keeper of the house shall tremble and the strong men bow themselves and the grinders cease because they're few. What's that? The teeth. Language begins to become a problem. Those that look out of the windows be darkened. What's that? I got bifocals this last week. Why? These things are failing. LASIK lasts for 20 years, but then it went away. And the doors 
shut by, shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird. Old people get up early, don't they? And go to bed early. Didn't do that when we were young. And all the daughters of music shall be brought low and when they shall be afraid of that which is high. I just told you about that. And fear shall be in the way. An almond tree, I don't have one of them, but the almond tree flourishes. What's that? That's the hair turns white. That's the almond tree. And the grasshopper shall be a burden. You think about that. When people get real, when they reach the end, folks, uh, the symbol of, even if a grasshopper landed on their show. You, know, you ever held a grasshopper? Even them big old graveyard crickets. They don't weigh nothing. But he says, what's a grasshopper? It's a burden. Everything's a burden. And the desire shall fail, because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the straits. Folks, all that language vividly sets forth. You know what it's showing? The downward track of when we started dying when we were born. Every one of us. And I tell you what, when you're young, you never think of getting old in that way. I guarantee you, if you're young this morning and you're hearing me talk about these things, you think, that guy's lost his mind. And I know because that's what I used to think. But when you get here, when you get old, you start looking at things differently in old age because you see the importance of youthful ability and health in all things. We need our, need our health, do we not? But here's the thing, especially when it comes to serving God in the declaration of His gospel to all who He providentially brings into your presence. My one goal for whatever time I have left on this lifetime is to share the gospel with anybody and everybody I can share it with. That's my goal. I love what one old author brought out on Solomon's words. He said, if age be thus necessarily oppressed from the common and unavoidable infirmities increased to such seasons, what must it have been the pressure of unpardoned sin an unawakened state of unrenewed nature added to that load that we bear. Oh, what a wretched old age is that which is full of transgression, without God, without Christ, ignorant of Jesus and his salvation, unregenerated, unwashed by Christ's blood, without any knowledge of his grace and power, unconscious whether there even be a Holy Ghost or not. If it's a burden without Christ or with Christ, what's it be without Christ? I tell you, most of the folks that are in this church family, most of us, the Lord brought revealed himself to us and in us when we were older. Didn't he? And I know you're like me. I look back on all the time I spent in false religion doing what was moral and kind and religious, all that activity that I participated in. And I wish, I know you do too, I wish when, I, when my kids and my family, we were all young, I wish I had known the gospel and could have shared it with them and made them see how I, God has taught me how important these things are. But folks, everything happened in our life in God's appointed time. According to His will, According to his purpose. But I said, what a privilege to know and, and remember your creator if you're young. This morning. If the Lord's taught you the gospel in, in a young age, count it a true blessing. You've got a, a lifetime ahead of you to share this same gospel. A lot of us didn't get that opportunity. Look at verse 6 through 8 and we'll quit. Or else the silver cord be loosed. Or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. In these words, the preacher, and that's what he calls himself, the preacher eloquently describes one thing. Death. And see, here's the thing. Death, both physical and eternal, is what all of us fear by nature. Don't we? I think it was last Sunday morning I told everybody, I know if I fall out dead right here now, I'm going to be absent from my body and present with my Lord. I know that. 
If I didn't believe that, I would not stand up here and tell you that. This ain't no maybe hope so situation. Kenny, I go, I'm with my Lord. I am. You say, how arrogant. I just, I take him at his word. But I tell you, there is still something so unnatural to consider that this body's got to die. And there's something that just scares me to my core about it. Now, you, you, know, you just said you're safe and secure. I'm safe and secure, but I'm human. And we fear that because it's, it's just kind of a mystery, that lack. We all got to cross over Jordan. That final Jordan, everybody in here, if we live long enough, we're going across. Thank God when we go across, we know what's there. By faith, we know what's there. But listen to me. There aren't any elegant words and there aren't any speeches that can be made by men that can soften the stroke of death. You just can't make it. You can't, you can't make that palatable. It's impossible. And see, here's the thing. Everything that Solomon records concerning life can equally be applied to the folly of this life. Vanity of vanities. Everything is vanity. Learn that lesson, young. Huh? Don't wait till you're in your late 50s like I did to have to learn. Because I, I mean, I've, I've known the gospel for uh, several decades now. The Lord's been growing me up, and he's teaching me these lessons now that I'm an older man. And I'm telling you in wisdom, learn these lessons. Why? If you believe the gospel this morning, learn today how insignificant the things of time are. Don't make them your goals. You're saying, well, you want us to be paupers. No, I hadn't said that. I encourage your children to get a good education. Help them. Be good teachers and instructors for your children. But above all, you know what? Teach your children how important the gospel is. It's, it's the only pearl of great price, is it not? And we can sum all the conclusion of this whole thing up with this. Death is blessed only one place. Where is it blessed? It's blessed in Christ. Outside of Christ, death, what is it? It's a curse. Our Lord told the Jews in his days, listen to this. If you believe not that I am he, worst thing could ever happen to you right here, you shall die in your sins. When you die in your sins, what are you going to do? You're going to find out that this God is a consuming fire. But to those who've been given ears to hear, his voice being brought by God the Holy Spirit to an awareness of their personal interest in Christ and his accomplished redemption. Folks, death's no longer our enemy. Huh? It's not. Death, really, you know what death is to the child of God? It's, it's our friend. I mean, you hate to think about it that way, but it's our friend. And it's the vehicle that delivers us from this life in this world of sorrow. And that's all it is. I, I love my wife and my children and my grandchildren. I love being with y'all. But folks, ain't this place a sorrowful mess? And it ain't got nothing to do with the politics. It's just awful. This is not our home. It's the vehicle that passes us from this present evil world and carries us where? Into the presence of him who loved us and gave himself for us. Delivers us into the arms of the everlasting God to be safe forever and ever and ever. Surely such blessed promises ought to motivate us who hear it to remember now our Creator in the days of our youth. But if you don't hear that, hear John's word. John said this of all God's children. Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord. Yeah, it's amazing when you see death spoken of when it regards a child of God, it's always talked about the same way. What's it called? Sleep. We sleep in the Lord. Why? There's no terror. Why? The terror was removed. Where? In the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope the Lord will bless that to your heart, mind, and understanding. You would take your Bible and turn with me to 1 